Thanks. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Sweet. Thank you for the opportunity um, to present. I'd like to briefly talk about a, a brand new research protocol that our Division of Human Genetics um, has developed called the uh, uh, Genomic Medicine Initiative. Just some background. Um, <clears throat> Our division um, sees approximately 1,600 uh, new uh, patient consults each year in various disease-specific areas, cancer, cardio, neurology, medical genetics. Um, most of these individuals are coming to our clinic. Uh, we talked about assessment, taking family history. A lot of them go through clinical testing, often now panel testing. And so the, the testing is still somewhat limited to their clinical indication. And our clinical and research focus over the years of our division as well has been primarily on single gene disorders, rare Mendelian disorders, and again, disease specific. We've had some genomic medicine focus, but it's been limited. Uh, we heard about the DCM study that Ray and Anna and Amy are working on. We heard from Smeek with regard to uh, some of his work with regard to diagnostic guided therapy for cancer based on somatic genomic analysis. Heather uh, Hampel and Rob Polarski are working with Smeek on that project. And then I um, also want to briefly present a uh, project that Amy Sturm and I are working on called the OSU Coriol Research Study. We have a number of participants that we've recruited over the last five years to this direct-to-consumer complex disease um, GWAS uh, study. This includes OSU patients with chronic disease and community participants. And specifically, individuals receive, almost like 23andMe, direct reports in, on their home computer with regard to risk for common complex disease. So just kind of going back to that question someone raised before, in thinking about common complex disease risk, beyond looking at genetic risk, what about non-genetic influences? And this study, in particular, incorporates some of these other lifestyle and environmental risk factors with regard to disease risk. These are actionable diseases. Um, so for example, <clears throat> uh, age-related macular degeneration, we found common variants in about 44% of participants with a pretty significant relative risk with regard to that uh, genetic risk. But actions an individual can take include things like not smoking. We found, oops. Uh, uh, DM2 risk variants and a, a good percentage of individuals on study. Where the, here the genetic variant risk is actually not uh, significant as compared to environmental lifestyle factors like elevated BMI. We also interestingly found within this uh, subset of 450 participants, uh, quite a few had actionable pharmacogenomic genotypes uh, for three um, uh, different conditions. So again, with regard to the concept of preemptive knowledge of an individual's drug response, this information, especially for these OSU patients on study, is being incorporated into the electronic medical record. So again, that's some background with regard to some of our focus um, <clears throat> on both single gene disorders in the clinic and then also some of our genomic medicine focus. There are some other examples. But uh, specifically, there's been no regular collection, storage of genetic genomic data for research purposes within our division at large. And specifically, that limits our ability to develop infrastructure for precision medicine applications. And also limits our ability to participate in large consortia and even apply for grants. The more data you have, the more you're able to apply for and uh, participate in these larger consortium studies. So in uh, the summer of 2014, Ray asked uh, for volunteers from our group from disease-specific areas to come together and start talking about maybe putting together a protocol that could encompass some of these issues, um, specifically <laughs> develop a repository protocol to prospectively accumulate genomic and also phenotypic data for collaborative research. We stress the importance of uh, defined phenotype with regard to matching up with genomic data before. And then seek vet collaboration. If we're already reaching out to all of these clinical labs for clinical testing, maybe we can actually partner with some of those labs and receive not only their clinical data back, but maybe even larger data sets, potentially. A lot of these labs still do not do even exome sequencing. Some are starting to do exome sequencing as a backbone in this next generation sequencing efforts. Um, maybe potentially we could hook up in that regard. 
So again, providing, patient comes in clinic, provide their clinical panel for their indication, but then maybe potentially get exome sequence, ideally even whole genome sequence at some point for research. Uh, obviously, through the vetting process, we need to uh, make sure whoever we collaborate with, with regard to insurance coverage for the clinical indication, with regard to quality of data, um, both for the clinical and the research side, um, turnaround time was important, and so on. And then also, uh, even potential research collaborations with some of these CLIA approved laboratories. And then um, <clears throat> we're going to hear from Dan next about a new platform that our division is just putting into place with regard to then storage and management of this uh, data from external research, external sources for research purposes. So we call this protocol the Genomic Medicine Initiative. Uh, it was approved very recently, last few months. It's a data and biospecimen repository for patients coming into our clinic interested in participating studies of the genetic and genomic causes of human health and disease. This repository will store and manage data, and specifically any information collected during a clinical encounter, so the medical history, family history, with periodic updating from the electronic medical record. So we have consent for that. So again, if we're thinking about drug interactions or long-term follow-up with regard to care, uh, we have access to that with optional uh, uh, collection of very specific samples if the individual is interested or uh, more specific for research purposes. Eligibility are clinical patients seen by practitioners of our division or practitioners who approach us and are interested in becoming um, co-eyes on this new GMI protocol. <clears throat> we can also, of course, accrue family members. We can even accrue uh, and obtain samples from deceased individuals. We have DNA banking studies and other types of collection studies in our division already. This, in a way, kind of extends it beyond that because we're going to try to collect as much as possible, including as much genetic genomic data as possible from the onset and over time. Specifically, the consent allows for use of these stored data and samples for future undetermined research conducted under separate IRB approval. So we have a, what's called the Human Genome Research Committee within our division that then vets uh, what potential uh, projects uh, would fit and a, pot a potential of access to uh, this uh, data that's stored. Um, this data may also be shared with collaborators from nonprofit, for profit entities. Again, there's a vetting process, but an individual has to have an IRB approved protocol stating what they would do with this information if they're going to access it through our repository. And uh, there's um, <clears throat> more specific information and protocol with regard to options for contact for preliminary results. Uh, comprehensive return of additional secondary results, say we uh, do research on an individual and they have a BRSA mutation, but they also have additional potentially actionable variants or even modifying variants with regard to further refining risk. Amy alluded to that with regard to further defining risk for individuals with FH and so on. Um, <clears throat> We did reach out. Um, we've been working on this over the last two years plus two to different CLIA certified laboratories to obtain, again, clinical NGS panels with at least exome uh, data as uh, uh, available on the back end. Uh, we uh, received approval to uh, collaborate with Baylor uh, in this regard, and specifically they have a nice uh, exome platform, their uh, more recent 4.0 version of their exome sequence platform where, again, we could order up to 100 specific disease-focused genes on the front end and receive uh, whole exome data on the back end uh, with pretty um, reasonable turnaround times for both. We're uh, uh, ongoing uh, negotiations with some other labs, including GeneDx. Um, I believe that if we can at least get exome data on these individ individuals, that'd be a great start. Ideally, maybe some of these CLIA labs in the future will actually have access to whole genome uh, sequence data, or we could within collaboration uh, through this protocol with other centers or institutions. Uh, bottom line right now, the protocol is approved through IRB. We're actively working internally to figure out how we're going to implement this as far as should we kind of do it um, somewhat slowly, maybe targeted. I put some examples here, targeted clinical cases, maybe very early onset disease, unusual uh, features in an individual with regard to cancer syndromes or cardiovascular disease. Um, 
But ideally, every individual patient that comes through our division could be offered this access to this new protocol where, again, we could collect their clinical data uh, and uh, look at that prospectively over time with regard to research and collect as much genetic genomic information as possible on the back end. So I think I've run out of time, but thank you. So today, I'm going to talk a bit about our efforts to deploy next generation informatics infrastructure to support the precision medicine initiatives that the division is engaging in and that you've heard about already today. And just to start with, we need to take a step back and think about what's different about informatics for precision medicine. Well, first thing is that genomic data really are as important as lab results or physical measurements for effective research and clinical care. So they need to be integrated with the other medical data. They can't reside separately, and they need to be accessible along with other medical data. The catch is that genomic data requires specialized infrastructure for storage, processing, and management. The files are huge. They're highly specialized. Um, and processing is very computationally intensive. So this is no small consideration. And one of the issues is that this type of infrastructure really is not routinely deployed within most medical centers. And there's good reasons for this, because it's not necessarily central to the IT infrastructure mission of a lot of those organizations. So the real question is, where should the data live in order to facilitate precision medicine? Where does it need to live to support getting thousands of exomes a year and doing stuff with them? So in order to answer this question, I'm going to take us through a case study um, using our experience in the division of human genetics. So basically, the previous infrastructure that we had was fairly typical for um, any clinical and research division in an academic medical center. So we had uh, databases at the Information Warehouse and the Comprehensive Cancer Center Data Center that stored clinical and sample data. And our genomic data files were generally managed by different groups on an ad hoc basis at the Ohio Supercomputer Center because this was really the only place with the type of scalable storage and processing power to actually manage and manipulate these files. So you can see that there are a lot of barriers to data integration. First one being that the data sources reside in complete, uh, different types of data reside in completely different locations in completely different software environments managed by completely different IT organizations. There's also the obstacle of the physical segregation of the hardware that stores these data because genomic data files being huge transferring between different locations over slower network connections is really non-trivial and can actually be a huge bottleneck. So another issue with this is that there were different user interfaces for accessing data in each of these sources. So these user interfaces range from SQL, basic users could use a client for the information warehouse, advanced users could use direct SQL, progeny required its own client software, and the Linux terminal was for advanced users at the Ohio Supercomputer Center to access genomic data. So clearly, these are totally disparate inf interfaces, and they require varying levels of user sophistication. And in some cases, certain user types would be blocked completely from accessing the data. So this meant that integration had to happen through human intervention. And it had to be the intervention of a human being with basically the greatest common denominator in terms of programming skills. So it had to be somebody who knew how to use all the advanced features in addition to the basic features. So we knew that this was not going to support 
getting thousands of exomes a year through the GMI and, and, and the DCM precision medicine study. So a couple of years ago, we started developing an integrated solution that moved the data integration from human intervention post hoc to an actual part of the system design. So we chose the BC Enterprise software platform from BC Platforms. And basically, this platform has different modules, BC Genome for managing genomic data, BC Clin for managing clinical data, and BC Sample for managing sample banks. And the data of all types from a given project can reside in the same software environment and be accessed using exactly the same standardized user interfaces. And they're different ones for different types of users at all levels. There's a user-friendly web interface for users who aren't programmers. There's ODBC access to the back end for people who want to program in SQL. And there's SSH terminal access for genomic data analysts and bioinformaticians. So we decided that we were going to deploy this software on a dedicated division-owned server that had some pretty nice specs and use it for integrating the data from multiple projects um, you know, across the division. Now, this system, as I describe it here, is actually woefully incomplete because it doesn't solve the problem of the scalability with genomic data. So, for example, this uh, storage configuration has about 16 terabytes of effective storage. That would be exhausted in less than a year at the volume we expect to accrue um, exomes. And the fact is that getting larger drives, there are only so many drive slots you can get in a single server. And larger drive sizes might affect performance. They get more expensive. So that's not very scalable. The other thing is every one of these exomes coming in needs some sort of processing. Maybe it's annotation because we have a VCF file. Maybe it's realignment using a standard pipeline so all our results are comparable. Either way, these tasks over thousands of exomes amount to thousands and maybe even tens of thousands of CPU hours. So having 16 processing cores on the server to do this would mean waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks with those constantly running and it couldn't do any other database tasks. So we basically needed an infrastructure that allowed us to have access on demand to a large number of compute cores, basically instantaneously provision hundreds or thousands of compute cores to deal with a bolus of data. And we also needed access to high throughput storage that was scalable so we could immediately say we need 10 more terabytes and have it within a very short time frame at minimal marginal cost without the fixed cost of acquiring new hardware. So to complete the picture, this system needs to be closely integrated with compute clusters and a high performance storage system like the IBM general parallel file system. And of course it needs encrypted tape backup on and off site and all of these other niceties. So the problem is most medical centers don't have compute clusters or GPFS storage pools. And they're really expensive to set up and maintain, both the hardware and the personnel with expertise required to maintain them. And acquiring that for just a division is not very economical because unless you can get your utilization rates on these up to the you know, 85 to 95 percent range, you are paying way more money than you need to and it's, the return on investment is not very good. So in order to do that, you have to share these resources with other users and you have to have a large pool in reserve so that you can provision large quantities of resources immediately or nearly immediately for very short times. So, that means that this server needed to reside in the cloud where these resources also resided and we could provision them immediately. So there are a lot of cloud providers out there such as Amazon Web Services you may have heard of that do precisely this type of configuration. In our case, we're lucky enough to live in a state that had the foresight to fund a publicly subsidized provider of 
uh, cloud resources, which is the Ohio Supercomputer Center. So we basically, from the beginning, started working with them and decided to house our server there so that we have the highest throughput access to all of these resources and at an extremely cost-effective solution. Um, I've done comparisons uh, for other presentations between the cost of this and Amazon Web Services, and people have been uniformly amazed at what a good deal this has been. So this solution is now deployed as the Division of Human Genetics Data Management Platform. So, of course, one of the first questions I always get about this is, is this regulatorily compliant? And the answer is yes. So the first question is usually PHI security. And we knew that this was enough outside of the beaten path that from the beginning it would be useful to engage the groups that set the rules here or enforce the rules. So we started from the very beginning talking with a HIPAA privacy officer and working with OSU uh, medical center information security and in working with them we over more than a year we were able to design a system that had all that met all their security requirements for regulatory compliance and last June we were actually approved to store PHI in it so this system is fully capable of handling PHI and we are subject to consent continued oversight by the information security group and we report any configure, planned configuration changes to them for approval. Now one thing I should note is that our security measures that we designed actually anticipate genomic data becoming PHI. Now that's not the case yet, it's not one of the 18 identifiers, but the fact is if any of you have had to sign a dbGaP data use agreement recently, you know that this is the way it's going to be in a couple years. And already we have used the fact that we configured the system this way as a guarantee for those type of agreements. So it's basically a ready-made approval for adhering to dbGaP security standards. So an example of the type of security that we uh, have implemented, our GPFS storage pool where we store genomic data, since that's not PHI, technically it wouldn't have to be encrypted. However, we just decided to encrypt it from the get-go so that when it becomes PHI, the requirement's already met. So the other set of regulations that apply here are human subjects research regulations. And basically, for research projects using the platform, the Institutional Review Board has to approve them before we will allow them to use the platform. And then we get, grant them access and they can use the resources to administer their to manage their data and upload it, download it, and do whatever they want. Now, the IRB itself has no oversight over the platform because we are just a resource provider. We're essentially you know, an IT group. However, we actually are subject to oversight by the OSU Office of Responsible Research Practices, and we consult them pretty closely on everything we do in order to make sure that what we're doing as platform administrators isn't crossing the line into engaging in research. So now that I've gone through this case study, just wanted to return to the question I originally asked, which is where should the data live to facilitate precision medicine? And I hope I've convinced you by going through our use cases and some of the reasoning that led us to our current system that it really needs to live on an integrated system in the cloud because, first of all, it's where you're going to find scalable processing and storage for genomic data. You're going to be able to implement a standardized user interface that can access all data types. The cloud's really the only place you can do this in a cost-effective manner because you can't get high enough utilization on you know, your own cluster or your own parallel file system unless you want to be get getting into the business of becoming a cloud provider. And it can be done so that it's compliant with regulations. And in fact, just as an aside, Amazon Web Services now, they're far more expensive than Ohio Supercomputer Center, but we could essentially implement the same solution there, and they will sign business associate agreements with, um, you know, with organizations that want to use their services for hosting systems with 
HIPAA PHI. So in closing, I just want to thank uh, the Comprehensive Cancer Center for providing the funding for this system and all the folks at the Ohio Supercomputer Center, our software vendor, um, and information security and the uh, Office of Responsible Research Practices who have helped us implement and bring the system to life. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And you can always email me later if you want. Thanks.